with the board present, we will call to order. Um, will the secretary call the roll, please? She's muted. I'm not hearing you, Sarah. Nope. We can see she looks like a United Airlines pilot, but we can't hear her. <laughs> Sarah, I would try unplugging and replugging your headset. And if that doesn't work, leave the Zoom and come back. Usually one of those will fix it. I'm reminded of the a line from Moonstruck where the grandfather, what nobody is speaking, and the grandfather says, Somebody tell a joke. <laughs> All right, we'll give her a chance to uh, come back in and uh, to start the, start the bowl. So has anybody seen any good movies um, at home? Watched um, <clears throat> One Night in Miami, uh -huh. Saturday night. It's a new movie on Amazon. Uh -huh. um, that? We can hear you. Hey, yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, I have a new computer and my, apparently my settings on my, uh, my web, settings were blocking microphone use. So my apologies. Let's try it again. Virginia Bloomshire. I'm here. Ted Foss. Here. Marianne Monraj. Here. Colleen Burns. I am here. Matt Fruth. Here. Christian Harris. Here. And Sarah Evan is present. Thank you, everybody. Sorry, it's hard when I'm not all on one screen. Yep, sounds good. So next item will be the approval of our minutes from our November 24th meeting. Uh, are there any questions, comments, or corrections that anyone has? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Ted Foss. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing no other discussion, uh, will the secretary take the roll, please? Yes, Virginia? Yeah. Ted? Yes. Marianne? Yes. Colleen? Yes. Matt? Yes. Christian? Yes. And I abstain. Thank you. Uh, moving on to public comments. I received no comments. Um, David, did you receive anything? I did not. I also don't see any names that are not associated with the library. Is there anyone who wishes to participate in public comments who is logged into the into the Zoom? I am hearing none. We will move on to uh, board comments and uh, calendar. David, is there anything you want to highlight? 
Uh, from the calendar, um, I would highlight the upcoming ILA West Suburban Legislative Virtual Meeting on February 19th. There is a uh, in simple way to register for that if you'd like, and there is no fee for that participation. And David, do you know what time that it's slated for? Uh, let me just quickly check. I believe noon, but let me quickly check my calendar for that. Well, really, it's easier. You don't have to hunt it down. I just was curious. I believe. I believe. Uh, I believe eleven thirty or noon. I believe that's correct. But yeah, um, I think we should have all got an email. I'll make sure to forward it again um, as part of the advocacy committee work. So I'll make sure that gets sent around to everybody again to see. And, and David, do we know uh, a little bit more about the scheduling of the upcoming Harwood meetings or when will we know that? Uh, no, um, the, the second part of the lab that was to take place at the end of this week has been postponed. I've been having conversations with Rich Harwood about it. There's some additional conversations that he would still like to schedule with uh, some of the uh, individuals who are members of the cohort uh, before we uh, decide when we'd like to schedule the remainder of that lab. So right now uh, it's just, it's postponed and there haven't been any dates selected for the, for the remainder of the lab yet. Okay, because it was interesting in the candidates forum on Saturday, um, other governmental agencies are really very interested in what's about to happen and so I know right. that you, you let people know that we have not scheduled that yet. So I just, sure. Okay. That's where we are. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, most of the other government agencies in the community, such as the township and the school districts, uh, they do, they do have uh, people who are a part of those organizations or who represent them that are, that are participating. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will certainly, when, when it's rescheduled, I'll certainly let all of them know what those uh, what those dates are. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to let the rest of the board know that that's what's going on. I had a quick question. It says regular library board meetings, but it doesn't have virtual. We're still planning to meet virtually, yes? Yes, until, uh, until the, uh, the governor's office or the state legislature says that we are no longer permitted to do that. Uh, I assume that it will be the this board's desire to continue to meet virtually. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that covers the calendar. Any trustee comments? Uh, not necessarily direct related to the library, but Christian, you were starting to talk about uh, your thoughts on the one night in Miami. And, I'm, and I would like to hear you have a chance to finish that thought because uh, I'm interested to, to hear what you oh, have to say. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I guess I'm still processing it. I just watched it on Saturday, uh, but it was, it was it was a very solid film. Like, so I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm a movie buff. So it's just from a cinematography, acting, you know, screenplay type thing. It was a really good film. Um, and then naturally also it was, uh, it was very deep, made me think a lot about all their different roles in the movement, all four of their very different but distinct and unique and necessary roles um, in the movement. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I'll say <clears throat> briefly, not to, and I won't talk too much about it, but I thought it was good. Did anybody else see it? I've been meaning to, I just, uh, with kids and everything right now, it's, Hard to carve that time away, <laughs> but uh, I do I do intend to, and I would definitely would like to circle back with you your thoughts uh, um, on it after after I have a chance to see it. Uh, Colleen, yes, I, I I sympathize with the Disney that Disney Channel is on regular <laughs> rotation. The best fourteen dollars I ever spent in my life. <laughs> well, and then I have since we're talking about films and board comment. Because Marianne was talking about virtual meetings versus in-person meetings, I think I, I wrote to to David and to uh, Marianne the 2008 uh, Pixar called Wall-E 
about humans deciding that they just can be in front of the computer. They don't need to move or exercise. <laughs> You're gonna laugh, Ted. My children are actually watching that right now. <laughs> it's on in my house downstairs. Excellent. Um, I, I just had one comment and this is not um, an arts comment, but uh, to the, I think the uh, team, I just wanted to do a special shout out to Barb Fitzgerald. David connected me with her um, as I'm trying to get acclimated to some new opportunities at my job. Uh, she gave me a tutorial on all things um, publishing and e-publishing and audiobook publishing. And it was incredibly helpful and uh, she took a lot of time and care. Um, and I'd, I'd value uh, if anyone is interested in understanding the complexity of the world that our collections team has to navigate in this environment to try to find diverse and representative uh, text and audio works. It is, it's a big job and she handled it with grace. And I just wanted to, to thank David for having her carve out that time and, and would welcome um, other folks join that conversation with her if you're interested in that work. Uh, that's great, Mary. Uh, great, Sarah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. We will move on to uh, staff reports. Does anyone have any questions for David's report? I had one quick question, David. Um, you indicated that we're going to do the installation of the external locker system in January. Uh, do you have, you know, clearly that month is getting away from us. <laughs> what, what's the, the date specific to when you're trying to get that installation done? And with this weather, is that going to be uh, yeah. delayed? Yeah, there were there were definitely uh, definitely some delays, including with delays in uh, in delivery of that system. I think that uh, Elizabeth is on this call, yes, and she might have a few more specific details than I do about that. Um, Elizabeth, would you want to try to answer the question? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, Basically, we have, yes, delay with the uh, delivery of those external lockers, and they are somewhere in transit. <laughs> uh, and uh, we still, there are delays due probably to COVID with transportation, with custom, this is what our vendor is saying to us. We were really hoping to have this installed by the end of this month, but uh, we still don't have ex exact, it's supposed to be delivered at the end of this month and installed. Uh, but there is delay with, uh, with delivery. So this is where we are. We are waiting <laughs> patiently. Uh, and at this point, I don't think we have any other options than checking with vendor. Kathleen Spayo, who leads this project, she checks with vendor <laughs> almost every other day, where we are, where we are. And, and then as of today, status is still in transit with delivery. Uh, but not to us from local vendor, but to, to, uh, to local vendor from, from production. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. We did uh, we did reinitiate uh, our grab and go service uh, last Friday, and uh, on uh, Feb on uh, February first, we anticipate uh, reintroducing interlibrary loan activity, um, as I also mentioned in my narrative, and are talking about uh, when uh, we expect to be able to reintroduce other previous uh, service level services uh, back to the community. David, I do have one question. Um, when we pick up books, um, they have been checked out to us. Um, when those books go out of the library, do we have any idea that they have been picked up and that, that they're in a patron's hands? Um, well, um, I mean, the only, if what you're asking is how can we be sure that uh, the person who we checked them out to has picked them up, um, you know, the only way, well, if they're not on the shelf, we're assuming they are, but the only way we would know that uh, if there were a problem is if a patron let us know that there's a problem, such as I came into the library and, and looked for the books that you said were waiting for me and I did not see them. Um, and that does occasionally happen. 
uh, but uh, that would be that really would be the only indication. So if I'm picking up the books for Foss and I happen to pick up a book for Franke, um, then we wouldn't know that because of the way that this not again not unless uh, not unless the patron told us that there was a problem. In which case, um, you know, we would assume that uh, either it was an error or that uh, someone else mistakenly picked up those items and then we would work with that patron to correct the problem. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions uh, regarding my narrative report? I don't hear any, so we will move on. So we also, um, Let's see, where did I put oh, the statistical report? Did I miss that? I guess I did. Let's open that up. There it is, the strategic objectives report. So we have the, uh, we have the narrative strategic objectives report where we highlight uh, in detail two of our learning objectives and two of our stewardship objectives. And then we have the, um, the uh, typical core use statistics uh, for the end of the year. And then uh, we have uh, the five-year comparative retrospective. And Mallory Edgar, our data analytics manager, was uh, kind enough to join us for tonight's meeting. So if any of you have any questions about either of these statistical reports that I can't answer, I know she would be happy to do so. Or if you have questions about any of the material in the narrative strategic objectives report, we've got most of, uh, or perhaps even all of the leadership team here as well. Um, Sarah, did you wanna ask a question? This might not be a statistical question, I think maybe as much as it may be for you, David, but understanding some of the core statistics, and I first and foremost, thank you for that. I think it's helpful for us to have that length of time and context. But how are you, as you're talking with peers, um, seeing kind of us benchmarking against how other systems are doing in this environment, knowing, you know, we at times, I think, may have been uh, a little bit more proactive around closure and, and limiting some community access, but we also have a very different patron base, I think, than some of our neighboring communities. So have you gotten some guidance or anec even anecdotal conversation about kind of how we're doing peer system to peer system? Not a, not a lot of, of uh, real hard statistical information. Again, as you say, most of it's anecdotal. Um, because I think it's fair to say that we've been um, perhaps um, a bit more cautious in how we manage our service levels uh, than, our, than other libraries have. Um, we would not necessarily see the same kind of statistics regarding, you know, numbers of people in our, in our building or um, numbers of, of materials being checked out. But at the same time, I think we are, uh, our, our staff, our team has been able to be um, much more, uh, I think, prolific, creative in the kinds of virtual and digital programs that we've been able to offer. And I think we are reaching an audience locally, regionally, and beyond that I think a lot of other libraries perhaps are not necessarily able to, to reach. So I think that the way I would characterize it is, you know, we are, we are, what we're doing is keeping people safe first and foremost, but are also, uh, have also been incredibly creative, our staff has, in how to, uh, and how to serve uh, people in the ways that we can serve them that are, that are keeping people safe. Um, you know, all libraries are, you know, there are, you know, people are not coming into the buildings, they're not attending programs, N none of the, none of the, 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 the typical ways that we've sort of measured our, our reach, our effectiveness uh, have applied in the last year. And so it's, uh, and, and now people are really, really realizing that and struggling with that in, as they prepare to complete their 
annual reports for the Illinois State Library and their per capita grants. Um, you know, how how do we really how do we really answer these questions? And you know, how do we uh, what what do these you know what do these comparisons from year to year really mean? Because this has just been a year like no other. So I don't I don't know if that completely answers your question, Sarah, but you know that's what I'm thinking. That's helpful. I mean, I think in some ways, some of the numbers and statistics seem painful, and I'm sure much more to your team who's used to being able to engage and, and really make strides in some of these key areas. I think it's just, it's helpful for us, I think, to understand, you know, how are, in, in spite of all of these scenarios, are we still being effective by comparison, you know, utilizing some of the, the tools that your team has been bringing forward. And it sounds like we right. are uh, kind of within the confines of what everyone's navigating. The, and if you want to just think of it in terms of the 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 um, feedback that we get from our own community, um, you know what what we hear, what our what our staff members hear from community members is, you know, overwhelmingly positive in terms of how we have been able to adjust and transition, and how we've been able to continue to serve even as people, uh, you know, are not able to actually enter our buildings. Um, and I say, and I think that's valuable anecdotal information to have. Uh, again, we we're getting a lot of a lot of support from from the community for what we're doing. And and David, speaking anecdotally, I have a good friend who is on the uh, Library Board of Trustees in Orland Park. And he and I kind of follow what's happening. And we are not unique. <laughs> we have our complaints and we're doing a good job. So I put if I could add just, sorry, uh, if I can add one thing, um, I, I listened to a podcast that's called Nonprofits Are Messy by Joan Gary, and it's, um, I'd recommend it to people. It's, it's pitched at sort of executive directors of nonprofits, generally pretty large nonprofits like Save the Children type stuff, but, but there's relevant things for smaller orgs. Um, and they just did an episode where they were talking about um, fundraising, you know, when you get rid of the big annual gala, et cetera, like what can you do instead? And it, one of the things they pointed out was that they have spent a lot of this year um, building video resources. And so now they have um, a library of uh, video resources they can use for future fundraising, future events um, that they didn't have before. So it's really expanded their capacity in that regard, as well as um, potential international reach. And so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't think I saw anything along those lines in this. So I, I mostly wanted to say as David is writing his, his reports and grant applications and so on, that might be something to highlight because I know our librarians have been creating a lot of video <laughs> um, for the community. And so that's, uh, I think, a, a sort of a treasure that the library will get to use on an ongoing basis after COVID's long gone. Oh, thank you. Yes. And I absolutely agree with the Zoom meetings that I'm looking at too. I hear these wonderfully innovative ideas and I'm hoping that somebody is archiving them. And I'm not sure if that's what a public library should do, but I'm just hoping that we have all of these incredible ideas that have come from the last nine, 10 months that aren't forgotten. Um, just, I'd just like to add, thank you all for getting the statistics together. I really appreciate it. Um, I know it was a lot of work, so thank you all for taking the time. Uh, and it was very helpful for me just to kind of see where we've, uh, where we're at, I guess, in 2020, uh, but more importantly, where we're at the years before. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what this year looks like. Um, so no questions. Thank you, Christian. Hearing no other discussion, we can move on to our financial reports. We have our just uh, we have our dis, uh, disbursement reports for November and December before us. Does anyone have any questions about any of the transactions in either of those months?
Hearing none, is there um, a motion to approve the November and December disbursement reports? So moved. Moved by Ted, is there a second? Seconded. Seconded by Sarah. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, will the secretary take the roll call vote, please? Virginia? Yes. Ted? Yes. Marianne? Yes. Colleen? Yes. Matt? Yes. Christian? Yes. And Sarah, yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, our general uh, financial report, we have the narrative for the year and all of the other documents. Is there any questions from anyone regarding any of that information? Uh, I did have a question about the snow melt system. Um, I, uh, well, I, I didn't know we had a snow melt system. I thought that was pretty cool. I had to look up and confirm that it was what I thought it was. Um, <clears throat> and then, so I guess from there, my question was just, how often does that need to be replaced? Um, and I'm just curious about, I guess, the cost benefit, you know, to would it be cheaper to have somebody just shovel it? Um, and so I'm just, and maybe you've already done this, but I was just curious and I wanted to ask that question. Thanks. Um, and uh, Jeremy's on the call. So if uh, I misspeak here, he'll, <laughs> he'll happily correct me. Um, so the snowmill system was installed uh, when the when the main library was built back in and opened back in 2003. Uh, at the time, I think to cover all of the of the plaza area, and then extending to the sidewalk on on Lake Street. Um, as far as I know, that system has never had to be replaced. So the system is original from the from 17, 18 years ago. There have uh, from time to time uh, needed to be some repairs. And I also think that at one point, uh, a, a small portion of it on the plaza near, near Scoville Park uh, did stop working. And I don't think was ever completely repaired. So in the wintertime, there is a small patch of concrete that uh, isn't quite covered by the system, but otherwise all of the plaza and, and a portion of the sidewalk are completely covered and, and works well. It keeps the, uh, keeps the entire area clear of snow and ice every winter. Um, what happened, unfortunately, as all of the Lake Street work was being done uh, and, the, uh, and the village contractors needed to dig up a portion of that sidewalk, uh, they didn't, I think, do uh, all of the investigative work or review of documents that they needed, didn't realize that they were cutting into an area that included our snowmelt system, damaged it, uh, and then it unfortunately needed to be repaired. That was, that was a freak accident. It wasn't something we were anticipating. It wasn't a, a, a typical um, needed uh uh, it, it was like a recurring repair. It was you know, an accident, um, but otherwise, um, yeah, the snowmelt system, as far as I know, has never needed to be um, need, never needed to have a, have a wholesale replacement in the in the seventeen years that that it's been in use. Um, Jeremy, is there anything you want to add to what I just said? I think that covers everything, David. Okay, thank this you. This was just a one-time thing. Hopefully. Yeah, that, yeah, hopefully. Did that, did that answer your question, Christian? Yes, definitely. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. And I think from an accessibility standpoint, it's probably a good idea to, to have that snow melt system. And uh, also, it's no fun managing snow removal people. Yeah. <laughs> One more question uh, would just be regarding uh, why the insurance only reimbursed 11,000th, I guess, of the cost. Uh, no, then I'm going to have uh, Jeremy j uh, jump in and uh, tell us, uh, remind us why only uh, that portion was covered. Sure. Um, where they where they cut it um, was a small section of the sidewalk, 
And so basically what the insurance did is once we looked at it with the engineers and we said, okay, we're going to replace this section. It was a full section of it. They said they would only cover only what they would have needed to do to just repair that one little section of sidewalk. So we would have had a patch there instead of replacing it fully. So that's what we just went, went ahead and did the whole section there. And so that was part of it. The additional cost that we had on there were, was to install the ADA um, tactile ramps by the driveway. So we had all of that work done at the same time. So figuring we'd just get it all done. And then we, we could only recover that one little portion that they said if we had just patched that. So okay. that's kind of where that was. Okay. All makes right. sense? No, yeah, it makes sense. Thank Jeremy, you. weren't we planning that ADA work anyway? You just said we weren't anticipating it at this time? It's in the capital asset study from 2016. Got it. So that was something that was on there. Um, the cost was higher than we expected, but we figured because we had Bully Andrews uh, concrete restoration in there. We figured we'd just get that done at the same time. Got it. Thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions, we will move on to additional reports. The only other part of the financial report is the quarterly uh, report that Jeremy includes when the Community Foundation um, sends us data on the, the value of the funds that we have with them. So that's included for your information as well. Thank you. So we'll go on to additional reports iGov. Um, Ted presented. Yeah, uh, so I will, I will say Colleen uh, attended the last iGov meeting. I didn't, um, but I did attend the candidate forum as a candidate. So um, maybe Colleen could first report on the meeting and then I can report on the forum. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. The, um, the meeting was all about preparation for the oh. candidate forum. So, um, and I was not able to attend. I, I was traveling that day. So um, would be happy to hear how it went from you guys. Okay, well, then I, I'll jump to the, sorry, I will jump to, I, I thought the forum went really well, honestly. Um, I appreciated how prepared the library was and ever and really everyone. Um, uh, thank you for putting those slides together. I'm afraid I was the person who pushed for that. I, my, my main um, request of this candidate forum is um, th that they do a, a slightly better job of orienting people, uh, incoming candidates, not just to um, the orgs themselves, but where those orgs fit into the larger political landscape of Oak Park. Um, and I don't know, I, I thought it was pretty helpful. There was a, a strong Q&A afterwards, and it seemed like all the candidates got their questions answered. Um, so that was that was my sense. Maybe the people who were um, on the panel could also report back. Um, um, as someone who was a presenter on Saturday, uh, one of the things that really stood out to me is how the six uh, taxing bodies all have in their forefront issue, the issue of equity. And I thought that was really, really good. And also how the presenters were talking about that. I thought the slides were very good. We all had five minutes each and we had three slides. Um, I was also interested that we had several people who are running for the library board who were there as candidates because in former candidate forums. We've had absolutely no audience. So that was nice to, to see. But um, this issue of equity just kind of boiled up and it was so interesting. Um, also, there were really good questions of people who are running. And I compliment uh, David for, you know, volleying those questions that came up and answering them right away. So it, it went well. I mean, I think we had maybe, Marianne, we had maybe what, 35, 40 people who were listening. 
Marion, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. I'm not sure I could actually see that as a participant. I didn't. I didn't make a note of it, but it it seemed like there were quite a few people. Yeah, and yeah. so it, and it worked well. And I I thought that one of the most important things, other than the issue of equity that came up, is to let potential candidates know what uh, somebody who's running for a trustee or whatever they're called in the various bodies, what we can do and what we can't do. And I thought that our library slide about, okay, we set policy, we have the executive director that we appoint, and we uh, look at the budget, and that's it. And I think that it really, really helped uh, potential candidates to understand that the things we don't do, and also how much work it is. And I think that there was a certain amount of frustration um, uh, with both, well, by the people who were talking about District 200 and District 97 about how much work it is. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. I, I, I did learn a few things, interestingly, attending this panel about some of the other boards. And um, so I'll, I'll just pull out two, two things that were useful for me from this was um, being reminded, I, I sort of had a vague sense of this, but being reminded that for the schools, so much of what they do is policy set by the state and they are, they are given a host of imperatives that they then uh, have to try to fund with the funds they have, right? And so, um, and they much, of, just that they can't, they don't have a lot of control over, over much of the policy that they're implementing. So um, that was a good reminder to me. And, um, and I think the, in, in terms of limits of power, and I think it was also useful thinking about, um, I think several of the boards um, that may at times be more contentious um, kind of made a point of saying that it really is incredibly important to be able to work together, um, essentially. And that I thought it was, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it was Rob Braymeyer who said that he has sometimes been able to kind of get more productive work done with somebody else who he's not necessarily generally ideologically on the same page as, um, but they can find the overlap and and actually um, accomplish something. And I think that's the the kind of thing that's very not clear to candidates generally. Um, and uh, the first time they run for office, and I, I don't know how how easy it is to make the general public aware of sort of the limitations of board power. Um, I, th I think the schools get a lot of demands that the board fix things that are just not part of their purview. Um, and it's hard when it's people's kids um, and everyone gets very emotional, so. And out of, out of that uh, candidates forum also, um, Marianne, I totally agree that it really was good to let potential candidates know that indeed we are limited about what we can do and can't do so you speak about you know having oh, virtual meetings and David has to say, well, there are these state mandates, you know, yeah. this and this and this. Um, and you know, what what is our discretionary budget versus what we have to do? Right. right. And the third thing was that um, indeed we are so lucky with the library that our tax levy is something that we have and we will have it whatever the economy is, we have that. So we don't have to lay off people. We don't have to, you know, but at least now. And the other thing that came out of it was that um, this whole issue of a few years ago about um, cooperation among government agencies. Uh, I, I think that that is kind of cooled down because people realize that indeed there are things we can do and can't do. So I thought it was a really good meeting. I, I guess I would just say on that front, I think all of the board members who are presenting and talking, I think sort of emphasize that if you're if you're looking to cooperation as essentially like a cost saving measure, that just is not effective for a variety of reasons. Um, that said, 
I, I personally would like to see iGov doing more. I think um, some of the other people on iGov would like to see iGov doing more. It's hard, everyone is stretched very thin with the pandemic. It's hard to push for that, but, um, but maybe you know, in a year or two, I, I'd love to see something like instead of a, a one and a half hour meeting on a Saturday morning, like every three, you know, like, I don't know, a, a one day retreat or something where we could really get into some of these issues and, and look at um, possibilities for cooperation. So um, anyway, and, and I, know this, I know the staff is doing that all the time and the executive directors meet with each other, but I, I feel like the board should be able to do more on that front. Um, okay, that's, sorry, I guess I had a more to say than I thought about iGov. So that's, that's my iGov uh, report about the candidates forum on Saturday. Okay, um, we will go on to Council of Governments. COG is not met since our November meeting. They are scheduled to meet next week. Um, I hope I get my parking pass. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you will. All right, and then L ILA legislative uh, legislation and advocacy, the uh, advocacy committee. Uh, met this month. Uh, the primary focus of that was the rollout of the uh, the beginning rollout of the meetings, invitations that uh, we discussed earlier tonight, and that we we're already getting uh, responses from legislators uh, because they are virtual that um, some legislators who had never uh, replied that they would even attend. They you know, they were maybes or no's in the past and now they're yeses. So it'll be interesting to see how this actually shapes up um, going forward with these, but uh, it might be um, it, interesting to see how uh, we end up, what the participation ends up looking like and when these meetings come around. And can I ask a quick ILA question, Matt? Sure. Do you think uh, just knowing some of the, the changes that are going on in Springfield and uh, the clearly the leadership change in um, the house, is there any kind of ILA anticipated uh, shift in pursuing particular policies or um, you know issues that may be more amenable in the new leadership structure um, that ILA has been pursuing. I was just curious if kind of that that no. shift would would potentially bring about any new strategy or if there was anything that that they were going to maybe wasn't going to move with Matt again, but maybe will. Not that I have not that's come up so far because we met on the first Monday. So before all of that really, I mean, it, any of that really shook out. Um, but that would probably be more on the uh, public policy committee than advocacy. Um, Got it. We're, we're, we're more like we take those ideas about the policy and work with library staff and board members to how to you know connect with legislators on those things. The public policy works more on what are the issues we're looking at um, for those. No worries. Um it's not on here, but we did have a, a friends meeting. I don't know if you guys want a quick recap. Oh, yes, please. Um, so David and I joined the friends conversation. Uh, they were very interested in all the work that the team uh, was doing. I hope, David, you felt I was representative of all of the work and that uh, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, operating in a virtual environment and how we were maintaining service and what we were doing for COVID protection. And, and this was kind of right in the midst of the, the additional uh, reduction based on um, some recent cases. So they were very complimentary of that. Um, there is, I think, still a little uh, perspective within the team that they kind of don't know what they want to do now that the uh, book sale is off the table. Uh, so it's it's interesting. I think, you know, their exploration or conversations around, uh, you know, what are the, like, what is their purpose is a little off. Uh, I think they kind of re really still need to define, you know, if they're 
expectation as a team is to continue to fund key programs, then I think they need to determine what are they going to do to do that as an alternative. Um, there is still, I think, a perspective within the team that they are holding on to the anniversary library uh, book sale, which you know may not come until 2022. And I think there's a, a good level of awareness that them pining for an event in this summer is still potentially not um, going to take place. So I, I think they're they're getting comfortable with being uncomfortable about that, uh, which I think was in some ways progress. But they they're still kind of pinning their hopes on it coming back one day. Um, and I think maybe the bigger question that they need to be addressing, and and I didn't put them on the spot on this on the call. And you know, David, I don't know if there's a, a good way for us to shape that conversation. You know, they continue to look to Paul. Um, because of his ability to continue moving forward with the book fair. And I think in some ways they, they kind of need to have a self, um, realignment about what, are, like, what is their purpose? And, and once they've determined what that is, how are they going to get there? Um, rather, I think right now their purpose is the book fair and without the book fair, there's not a lot, there's not a lot of there there. Um, so lots of good intentions kind words between friends but but i think they're just they're a little they're a little lost right now sarah in that regard is has among the friends has there been any talk about all the little libraries that are popping up because that's not a not a word really because that seems such a natural i mean to me the natural would be let's define the programs we want to enable through our funding and let's figure out how to fund those things, you know, but I'm looking, I think I look at them as a, a, a tool for the library, you know, to be given the opportunity to potentially do some things that maybe our traditional budget allocations won't allow, you know, and, and unfortunately, I think there are things that they have funded that might not happen um, unless we make choices you know, as as we go through the budget process to enable David and the team to continue them. So I think, you know, in some ways that their lack of direction in some ways I think could come back to us. So I, you know, I, I shot a quick note um, just to Paul, you know, privately to say, hey, if you wanna connect, I'd love to just talk, you know, from the board's perspective about what you wanna accomplish you know, for funding, you know, are there key programs you want to ensure are protected or things that are very valued to the to the team? You know, they started to get a little bit of fresh uh, energy from a couple of employees or a couple of team members right before COVID hit with an interest in maybe a fundraising committee and, and a little bit more structure around non book club funding. Um, but that just didn't gain much steam, I think, once everybody was in a virtual environment. Well, it's, so I don't know. I haven't heard back from Paul, <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll follow up with everyone if he responds and, and has some thoughts. As David Selleb has said in a couple of earlier meetings, I do not want to be the person who stabs the end of Friends of the Library. I mean, I'll, I will, I'll jump in to say that, you know, I, I think Friends of the Library, similar to the Garden Club, kind of was a primarily a social club, I would, you know, for a small group of people, right? Like that was, I think, how it had functioned for many years, possibly several decades. I'll, I'll note the Garden Club has transformed, right, with adding a Facebook group, um, which is now kind of split off from the, the formal Garden Club, but it's an incredibly active Facebook group um, with with tons of stuff happening and we haven't tried to do any fundraising through it but i think if we if we had something we wanted to accomplish we could probably do a lot very quickly so i i would like i would you know i i would love to see essentially a a new group of people come into friends and and revitalize it with the kind of um approach that sarah is talking about right and um and I think it, it's it's just a matter of sort of motivating, I don't know, five to ten people who who are willing to kind of make it their their project for the year. Um, it wouldn't take very much to to get that restarted. So, anyway, I'm not volunteering yet. Okay. <laughs> 
I was going to say that, Marianne. Are you uh, are you interested in starting a, a sea change? Well, certainly. If I don't, I'll tell you this: if I if I don't get elected to school board, maybe. Um, so we'll see how that goes. All right. Well, let's get on to new business, the holidays uh, policy. All right, uh, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, I think in my narrative, uh, the revisions that we're proposing for this policy are primarily to uh, clarify uh, and update some language that we, uh, that we use. From the old uh, from the old policy to the new, but more importantly, to include uh, Juneteenth as one of the officially recognized no service holidays for for the library. So we've got the the draft here with the the revisions, the proposed revisions that you can see, and then uh, the clean version as well. And Billy Treese is in the meeting and could help me answer any specific questions that you might have. Are there any questions for David or Billy? Okay. Um, is there any discussions or concerns regarding the, the, rev the revisions presented? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve uh, the pro the proposed? Um, so moved. I hear a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Christian. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, uh, Sarah, will you take the roll, please? Virginia. Yeah. Ted. Yes. Marianne? Yes. Colleen? Yes. Matt? Yes. Christian? Yes. Sarah is yes as well. Um, one question, David, is that the first time Juneteenth is on there as a um, library holiday or has that been on there in the past? Y yes, no, this is the this is the first time that uh, that was uh, sort of pre-approved by the board at the end of last year when we uh, when we um, adopted the calendar for the year. And so Billy reminded me that we also needed to update the actual policy statement. So that's what we just did. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay. We will go on to the uh, RGW scope and contract. So I wanted you all to uh, to see the contract for the stage two scope of work, all of the work that is outlined to be accomplished in 2021, uh, along with the uh, the contractual amounts, all of which were included uh, and approved as a part of the budget process at the end of at the end of last year. Um, the stage one contract uh, concluded uh, at the end of 2020. All the work that was outlined in that agreement was completed. All of that work was uh, it really began uh, early in the year uh, with uh, all of the, the preparation work that Rashida did uh, and included the formation of several um, groups related to the work, including the anti-racism advisory team, uh, the Black Affinity Group, it included a lot of staff training, uh, a formal training for the library's leadership team, a training session with the board of trustees, uh, a couple of all staff training sessions. Uh, a lot of that was the, um, and, and the beginning of the work on the anti-racism strategic plan. So all of that was a part of the stage one scope of work that we completed in 2020. And now the stage two scope of work begins uh, which is a great deal of work, as you can see. Uh, it's a very ambitious uh, implementation schedule for 2021 uh, that uh, begins with uh, 
presumably the conclusion of the development of the anti-racism strategic plan in quarter one. Uh, it includes uh, a lot of work that um, I think uh, came out of uh, early conversations with the, uh, with the anti-racism advisory team, including uh, a review or audit of library policies, of the library's budget, of the library's uh, job descriptions, um, and, uh, and a, a continuation of, uh, of training for managers and, and staff as well. Um, and um, I know we have people on the call, including Virginia, who's a member of the anti-racism advisory team who may want to uh, add some, some thoughts and comments to this. But um, uh, essentially I wanted you to, to see and have a copy of the, of the stage two contract and scope of work so you could see uh, in at least summary form what's planned and what we have contractually agreed to pay Rashida or RGW Consulting for all of the work that we will do throughout this year. So Virginia, do you want to speak first? Because I've got some comments about the, uh, the proposal and I've spoken a little bit of, to David about these things, but I don't want to step in until Virginia speaks. Um, sure. Uh, I don't have too terribly much to say. I will say I'm very impressed with how the group has worked. Um, from from the outside, it may not look like it, but the, the group that's putting that together is an extraordinarily diverse group with a lot of different points of view and perspectives. And initially looking at what Rashida told us would be possible by the end. Um, I can tell you I had a lot of optimism that it would happen, but not necessarily a lot of faith that it would happen. Um, but starting to see something concrete come out, starting to see something that I know we can put in place that can outlive all of us and our best intentions is, is um I don't know, it's, it's just really hopeful. It, it means that we can take these ideals and the things that we all know that we want to do and put them in place in a way that um, will make them part of the, the environment of the library moving forward and hopefully part of Oak Park more moving forward. So I, I love that we're, you know, I, I say we, but they are putting together something for us that will allow us to have um, the benefit of something codified that can't easily be disregarded. It would have to, to have to actually be dismantled. Um, and, and, and I like the idea of that. So that, that's all I have right now. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we, as a board, take the ideas that are being handed to us and, and sort of have them come to fruition and, and how the, the greater population of the library and, and the greater community sort of react to, to what's coming out of the group. Thank you. Um, so I've got a couple of questions. One um, is RGW, Rashida's group, they're, they're also working with other entities in Oak Park, correct? I think that's correct. Um, one of them, I I think they are. She is working with her firm is working with is the Township of Oak Park. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't have a, a comprehensive list of all the organizations she may be working for, but I am fairly certain she's working with the township. Okay, because that would be interesting as we look to this forty thousand dollar budget, because one of the things that came out of the IGOV meeting on Saturday was, of course, the issue of equity. And I kind of like to know before we sign our agreement, um, how are we cooperating with these other entities, particularly in Oak Park? So that was just, that was one question. And secondly, I think I shared um, with David uh, the wonderful, uh, I thought it was wonderful, a statement about uh, equity, diversity and inclusivity from the Francis Parker School. And I thought it was a really nice template. And I'd like to share it with my 
fellow board members, really well done. Um, so to think about that, then turning to the scope of work on uh, the, the document that we were shown, um, it says that we will begin the implementation. I think that's in the overview. Um, the, the equity strategic plan implementation? Scope of work overview. Mm -hmm. um, and just that uh, together we will begin the implementation. I mean, we're talking about, okay, we've spent $20,000 last year, $40,000 this year, being, beginning the implementation. And I, I, I basically, my, my question is, um, what is our outcome for uh, 2021? What, what is the outcome for the resources that are about to be spent? Can I, can I just jump in? I, uh -huh. There was something said at the iGov thing on Saturday that, that is relevant, I think. Um, and I think, again, it was Rob Braymeyer talking about the um, anti-racist work that they've started doing at the schools. And he, he pointed out, and I think this is true, that, that it is, in fact, it's a very long-term project, right? So I, and they don't expect to see quick results on it. It's, it's gonna come out in stages. And I thought, one thing I thought was particularly interesting, is someone had asked about like, how do you measure the results um, of like on student performance and so on of all kinds of initiatives. And he said that it's actually um, generally, while they do measure all of that, they look first to changes happening within the staff because that is a leading indicator, whereas um, changes happening for the students is a lagging indicator. And I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and it made a lot of sense to me, right? That if the, if the teachers start teaching differently, um, you will then start seeing a result, but it takes a little time before that shows up in the students. So I, I wanted to kind of just put that framework of leading and lagging. And when we look at things that are quantitative that we can measure, you know, perhaps first we look to changes in staff approaches to various things um, and board approaches to various things. And, and I thought in, in this contract that there was a really good amount of time that uh, Rashida is thinking about how working with staff and with the the committees that have been appointed by OPPL. And that's that's important and it's time consuming. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, the, the Francis Parker stuff, and I will give that. I also would like to have um, conversations about how to integrate this work with the Harwood looking out, outward stuff. It's just a, a thought. And, um, as I looked at logistics and deliverables, um, the workshop preparation, prep, I'm sorry, preparation time um, that aside from the OPPL, what work um, is uh, Rashida's group going to do outside of OPPL? And that gets to the iGov and, and all of this stuff. And then she finishes with logistics as a final meeting to discuss the holistic experience. That's fine. And then going down to terms of agreement, um, she basically says that, okay, some of the things that she's determined belong to us and some of the things are proprietary to her. And I'm not a lawyer, but I'm kind of concerned about, okay, when we come out of the end of 2021, what do we own and what can she carry with her as her firm goes forward? Does that make any sense? That, make, that makes ten, sense, Ted. I think that um, there, will be, there will be a lot of, as you call them, deliverables that will belong to us, uh, including uh, all of the plan documentation, uh, and other things that like that that she gives us. I, I only Rashida can answer this question uh, officially for herself and her organization. But I think that the propri the proprietary things she's she's talking about are her own internal planning documents, 
the things that she's developed as training modules. You know, for instance, she's going to, in, in March and April, she's going to take the members of the management team, the 10 members of the management team that we have through, uh, through a series of four training sessions that were that are essentially identical to the ones that she did with the leadership team in 2020. She's going to spend a total of 12 hours in training with all of them, um, and there will be there will be things that that they will take away from that that will belong to them or to the library. But the uh, the actual training that she's developed, the the modules and and the internal documents, those are the proprietary things that that she's talking about. And, um, and that all that all makes sense. Yes. Okay, great. But um, you know, I, I think that we need to know what she's doing with the other entities in Oak Park and how that works together, how our Harwood stuff works together. And then as we think about what the deliverables are or a document, a philosophy of inclusion, equity, diversity, um, I'm hoping that we can look at other good models. And this is something that will come out of the communication that we do in the, in the coming year um, because we're not reinventing the wheel. Okay, you mentioned think, a couple of times. Um, you mentioned a couple of times working with other entities in the community, and that was something that we've definitely discussed. It was one of the things brought up right off the bat. And one of the things Rashida mentioned was that each of these entities in Oak Park needs to find their own voice, their own place where equity movement can be made. Um, other areas of the village are going to move at different speeds and in different ways than we are on certain things. Um, and so knowing necessarily where other entities in the community are in this work isn't unimportant, but it can't be something that our work relies on and it can't be something we necessarily rely on dovetailing with moving forward. Just because she's doing the same kind of training with them doesn't mean they're going to have the same outcomes. They're not going to have the same priorities, even within an equity framework. So I, I'm a little bit hesitant for us to get too caught up on where is everybody else in this work, um, especially knowing that you know the library tends to have a more progressive voice on issues related to equity and access and a lot of the things that we're working on. I don't want us to get into a position where we look around and say, well, you know, we've already done this, this, and this, we can, we can slow down, we can hang back, we need to wait for the rest of the community, or how do we dovetail it? I would much rather we sit down and, uh, I guess for lack of a better phrase, get our own house in order and start being an example of these things. Um, from what I've seen, our staff is excited about this. They want to move forward with these things. They have the ability to move forward with these things. And they know that they have our support in doing that. And I'd rather we move forward as an example and do the things that we know need to be done for our staff and for how the community reacts to us rather than waiting too much or looking too much or being too concerned with how other entities are working with her. Thank you, Virginia. That's very helpful. And I will, I will uh, with your permission, David, if I could just uh, send this uh, stuff from Francis Parker School, I think it's a really nice couple of documents about mission, vision, and case. <laughs> sure, of course, Dad. Or, or I can simply forward uh, to the board what you sent to me. Thank you. I had uh, one thought, Ted. I think you said something to the effect of like, kind of, what are we getting from out of the contract, or what are we getting out of it? And so I guess to that, I would just say we're getting a roadmap on how to transition the library into an anti-racist organization. And this is just another year in this step and in that process. Um, and it's going to take, it's obviously going to take time. Um, but I think what she's laid out here is a great next step for the coming year. Um, it honestly looks like two years worth of full-time work as I'm looking through it. So I think it's a great deal. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that we'll be able to get through all of this uh, in 2021. 20, uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm excited to see you know, what that looks like. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just echo what Virginia said. She said it much more eloquently than I, I will right now, but we can't wait for the rest of the village to, to, to move forward with this type of work. Pat, and what, one of the things that I found exciting about Rashida's proposal for 2021 
is that um, she is working so much with the staff and the committees that have been set up. This is not something that the board should be doing. It's not something that we should look for other entities uh, within the other taxing bodies to do. So I'm in total agreement with what you're saying. And uh, I'll have the good, honest broker in all of this. Yes. And then I'll have a few more thoughts when we talk about the Harwood Innovators Lab, about a little bit about how this work kind of intertwines, if it intertwines. So, yeah. I was just going to ask a question to that effect, Christian. Um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, Ted, and in, in kind of this external facing work. I agree with Virginia in her like, let's get our own house in order and make sure our people are supported. We're doing the work and, and walking the talk um, before we kind of espouse a leadership position to kind of take this out with our Hartwood methodology. I like that that ability for us to be continue to be a leader. I think being able to come to the table with her at the time that we did afforded us the opportunity to get to be, I think, ahead of many organizations in beginning this work. Um, but I do feel like I don't want to push too hard, you know, to, to um, Christian's comment, I, I feel like this is a pretty good deal. I mean, as someone who's paid for corporate diversity and inclusion training, um, I've paid more money for like two sessions with my team then she's asking for for a year of pretty aggressive it looks like process and and evaluation work which again maybe that's just corporations not being as mindful about budgets but i i mean i'm, I'm very i'm very impressed with the amount of work she's moving for the value um personally but i do i do wonder if that external facing transition ted that you're speaking to maybe something that we really work in in partnership with virginia and and frankly the affinity group to say kind of when I'd, I want us to feel like within the leadership team and, and the affinity team that that's kind of the step that's that we're ready to take. I don't want to kind of drive down, you know, now we now we've, you know, kind of started this work in earnest here, we've got to be ready to take it out into the community. Like, I, I want to really get it right first and feel like we're giving people the space we need to do that effectively before maybe we come in fast with the Harwood play. That, that's just my point of view. Um, but I think I would defer, you know, Virginia to you as you're being part of this leadership conversation, kind of the pacing, I feel like really in some way should be dictated by that, that team to me uh, and to kind of check in with us and with David to say, we're ready to take, uh, you know, to take this to maybe an external dialogue beyond the, the walls of, and the virtual space of the library's team. I think one of the really interesting things that Rashida is having us do is look at equity and racism in general in different kinds of quarters. You know, how does it work within the library? How does it work within our staff? How does it work with the library interacting with the community and so on and so forth? So I think I, it, the way I'm looking at it, and, and Rashida may come back and tell me I'm completely wrong, um, but the way I'm looking at it is, you know, if we do work on cultivating this within our leadership, within the development teams, within our staff, we can use part of that hardwood method to train in-house and learn more in-house it'll obviously be you know smaller conversations that we're having and smaller groups that we're getting together but we can use some of the similar methodology within the library and sort of hone that skill before there are more of us who are able to turn it outward to the greater community so my hope is that because you sort of parse through that there are different levels that we're looking at We'll get a little practice with a softer crowd um, in-house while we're working with our staff and we're working with each other. We can perfect some of those, those things. We can perfect some of the ways that we reach out and we get our questions in order and, you know, sort of streamline and truncate what ideas we think are going to be the most important for the community before we start doing, you know, the greater hardwood, like turning out to the full community. Thank you. This has been really helpful. And as David knows, I've been thinking a lot about this and uh, th th this all makes sense. So thank you. Can I, I just want to add one thing, mostly for public comment in case, um, in case people aren't aware. Uh, and I, I could imagine that people, you know, patrons may look at this and say like, 
um, something I hear in the community is sort of a question of like, is there a need for this in Oak Park? And I would just um, note that, you know, a, a week and a half ago, I think it was, um, someone threw a brick at Live Cafe, which is um, Rashida's other business, uh, and uh, with a note attached to it that said no N words on the ballot. And I think, um, so if you're, if you're not familiar with this, it was covered by the news. There was a vigil, NBC and CBS and so on sent news crews out. Um, so I think if people come to you and say, you know, ask questions about, is there a need? I think you can, you can point to that among many other things to say, yes, clearly, clearly there is a need for this in our community. So, and, and we can start with the library here. And thanks, Ted, for actually bringing that stuff up. I, a couple of perspectives I hadn't even I hadn't particularly thought of. So I am glad we got to have the conversation. Well, thank you, and it's it's a, it, it's a conversation I've been thinking a lot about, and uh, I, I appreciate the the beautiful and compassionate listening. I, I do have one quick question, and and again, I don't want to put more work on on you, Virginia, or you know, David other team members that might be supporting these ongoing meetings first thank you for doing them because i think you're probably doing a ton of work behind the scenes that we're not getting to see um but is there a report out that that you're sharing or like bullet points that might be something that you can share down with the board as these kind of connects happen and and you do learn some things or you know maybe um have some findings that might influence how progress is going just um you know maybe more anecdotally than than just at our monthly meetings. I just would love to kind of keep on top of it with you and learn as you're learning, Virginia, if if that's not asking too much or or maybe David, somebody from the team could um, share that. Unless it's, you know, we're only sharing kind of with the team members that are there because we're respecting people's privacy, et cetera. Um, I just, I'd love to stay uh, a little more connected to it than I think I am or I feel like I am right now. David, I'll defer to you a little bit on that. I do know that some of the documents we have still have people's names in them because they're working documents. And I wouldn't want to share them quite yet until we have people's names cleared out of them. And it, it's presented more as a group document than um, a document with, with individuals tagged with some of their comments. Yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely right, Virginia. And this whole board will be seeing a draft of the proposed anti-racism strategic plan very soon. We are staff members, library staff members are right now reviewing it and providing feedback for Rashida and the, and the advisory team. And all of that is gonna go back to Rashida and to the team in, in a few days. And then the advisory team has a couple of meetings scheduled in February and March to incorporate all of that and to uh, adjust the uh, the plan accordingly. And then by March, that uh, that plan will be coming to the board for its uh, its review, its discussion, its consideration, and then ultimately its uh, its adoption. Um, so you will be uh, you will be seeing the the results of all of that work and conversation uh, that's been going on for the last several months really soon. And a, just a technical question, um, this contract that we're looking at for discussion now um, begins January 1st of this year. And so if and when we adopt it in our next meeting or the meeting in March, um, then she will be paid from January 1st because it's kind of strange that we're told that this contract should be signed by the 1st of January of this year. And we're still in well, discussion about it. No, no, what, no I'm sorry, Ted. To I'm okay. sorry, Ted. Yeah, to be to be clear, Ted, the this uh, the um, the board um, approved the uh, the funds to do this when it adopted the budget at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. I have already signed this contract and returned it to Rashida. Okay. So, um, so, so I, I, I apologize if, I'm, if I wasn't clear about that. I wasn't presenting this document for the, for the board's approval. I've already signed this contract uh, in my capacity as the executive director and, and returned it to Rashida. What the board will receive 
soon for adoption is a, is an actual strategic plan. Okay, because I did see your signature or your scrawl there, and I wasn't yeah. sure if that was actually the contract. So yes, it is. Yes. All right, I think we're ready to move on to the per capita item. Yes, uh, so the uh, to meet the uh, the uh, qualifications or stipulations for this year's per capita grant application, the Illinois State Library has decided that uh, every board, every library board, uh, should review the entire document, every chapter of serving our public 4.0 standards for Illinois public libraries. Uh, at a public meeting and have an opportunity to ask questions or discuss what they uh, what they might think about the lot their own libraries progress toward meeting the standards. So this month I've just included that entire document. It's something that I have had previously given to all of you, either in in hard cover form or in hard form or in digital form. Um, so I've put it in this month's packet. Um, I have no idea <laughs> whether any of you actually had an opportunity this past weekend to look at this, but I will also include it again for any, any discussion you might wanna have in February uh, before the, the actual grant application has to be completed in, in March. So you can take this time if you'd like to have a discussion or you can wait and have that opportunity in February when I include it on the agenda again. Is it cheating for me to ask if there's anything you think we should look at? There, uh, honestly, Virginia, no, <laughs> because uh, our library really meets or exceeds all of the standards in every chapter of this document. I don't think there is anything that, uh, that our library does not meet or exceed. Um, and so it re really would only be if there was something that the board thought they wanted to ask more questions about or were concerned about, uh, but I don't have any concerns and there's, there's nothing that I would specifically draw your attention to. I, I did look through it and um, I would agree with David's assessment, I think, um, our, our staff. I was like, you know, there are all these check boxes and I was like, check. Check, check, like, you know, um, it's it's gonna be useful to me because I have a teeny tiny nonprofit and I was looking through it and I was like, oh, here are the things to aspire for towards and work towards in our own strategic planning. Like, let's let's start having like one full-time paid staff member. That would be great. Um, and then go from there. So um, so yeah, so this but that's I I I would say my my assessment is that the our library is in very good shape on this front. Thanks, Marianne. So in reality, I mean, if, if uh, unless uh, the board really wants, uh, I only had to include this topic on, on one of your meeting agendas. Um, if there really aren't any questions, concerns, or a desire to continue a conversation next month, I don't have to put it back on the, uh, on the agenda. I can, uh, I can just take this as, uh, as your, um, I guess, uh, you know, uh, satisfaction with the conversation and I can just move forward and complete the application. Does that sound okay, Matt? That sounds good to me, unless there is anyone. I, I defer to Marianne's uh, judgment. I, she, she probably looks at this stuff a little bit more critically than I do as someone who has looked at it multiple times. No, it was, it was really interesting for me. I, I admit you've given it to us before, David, and I have sort of like glanced at it and not read through. I actually read through it this time. So, um, so yes. <laughs> Great, thanks. Go forth and apply, David. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to add this part. When I was, when I was a young librarian, watching directors complete this uh this application every year um it was it got it, it was funny because they they would often it was it was often a joke among many of them and uh and uh some of them often referred to it as their annual opportunity to dance for dollars <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> 
What's the line from the Disney movie when I was a one a young warthog? <laughs> so we will go on to our uh, item nine D, the Oak Park Harwood Innovators Lab. Hey, I uh, yeah, I added that uh, as a topic for discussion, uh, primarily at uh, at Christian's uh, request to have a conversation about what's uh, what's happened, what hasn't, what we've learned, <laughs> and uh, and and I guess perhaps where we think we're moving on from here. So I'll, uh, if it's okay with him, I'll just let Christian begin the conversation. Definitely yes. No, thanks, David, for putting it on the agenda. Um, I appreciate it. <clears throat> I want to make sure everybody we're all on the same page. So just I guess just a little backstory because I know Sarah and Marianne. Ted sounds like he's pretty familiar, but just want to make sure. So David had gotten a donation for twenty five thousand um, to have the Harwood Innovators Lab in Oak Park uh, with twenty five community leaders. And I'm oversimplifying a lot, but the goal was to like help us build change in the community, the change in Oak Park and our community. So Virginia. Colleen, Matt, David, former trustee Janet Kellenson were all involved in that group. And uh, I just wanted to get everybody's thoughts on how it went and uh, get your feedback and everything like that. Uh, I'll share a few thoughts first, uh, but like I said, I definitely wanna hear everybody's thoughts and feedback and um, where we're, where, what the next steps are too. So um, for me, I, I didn't think it went great. Um, I do think there were some good conversations uh, that needed to be had that did take place. I'd like to think some progress was made, but honestly, I go back and forth on that. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, it was a pretty anxiety inducing couple of days for me. I was actually right here at this, right here. And I remember like, I was almost at the point of shaking like a couple of times, she was just about shaking a couple of times uh, from like uh, the anxiety and some of the tension I felt, some of the things I felt I could and, and couldn't say. I definitely uh, went in trying to be bold and unapologetic um, because I, I believe that's what community needs from everybody right now, but by the end of it, I definitely found myself censoring myself, um, as I often do in this community, out of fear of offending people or fear of financial ramifications for my business and future personal professional plans. And I was just really hoping this would be different, this, this space, this time, uh, all we had been through in 2020, I, I was just hoping it would be a little bit different. Um, I, hearing, hearing about Harvard for the last four years, I definitely, I can't say I necessarily bought in, but I was really hope I was really hopeful and proud of what it had done for the library, and very hopeful for this discussion that it could help move forward. Um, so, and yeah, I guess unfortunately the same the same fault lines, the same community fault lines, just kind of reared reared their heads in the course of the innovators lab. So, um, I don't want to say too much. Um, I did try really hard to step back during the, during the session, which probably didn't, didn't feel like it, but uh, there was just so much I felt like I had to say, so much that wasn't being said, so many things I feel like we needed to address as a community. So uh, I will stop there. I'll probably have some more to share after, after you all talk for a bit, but um, I just am curious to hear where you all were at with it and what your takeaways were. Well, this is, this is Ted Foss, somebody who also participated in an innovator's lab down in St. Louis, and it was partially paid for by the library. And I, I came away with learning stuff, but also, as Christian said, a little kind of thinking, okay, um, we're kind of being led, this is probably too harsh, led by the nose by Rich Harwood's idea of looking outward. And I'm just looking at my little uh, notebook here from St. Louis. And it's it was wonderful. But I would love to talk to Christian about those anxieties that you had as well. So I don't know, and a former member of the of the library board, uh, who's no longer on the board was with me. And um, it's uh, it, it's interesting, and I, 
I think that we really do need to kind of sit down and talk about how we can go forward with this. So, so I don't know, Christian, this is probably not the forum to do that, but um, I was also kind of uh, squirming in my seat sometimes. Does that can, I ask a, can I ask a quick question? And Christian, and if you don't want to talk about this in this environment, I completely understand. I'm happy to talk to you offline. Um, but was was the root of, of some of the feelings you're sharing about the format, about um, the community people that were participating, about the process itself? Could you just expand a little bit on kind of what, or if you if you know, um, kind of what was driving that? Yeah, I, th I think as everybody else will probably echo, there's a, there was a lot there, but if I had to boil it down, it just felt that um, when Black people in the lab were kind of being bold and unapologetic, uh, they were kind of asked to tell indirectly and directly to tone it down um, a bit. And uh, so, yeah, if I had to say one specific thing, that's what I felt, which is, is I think, a common thing in this community. But... I was just, again, hoping that this would be different. There Thank was, you for sharing that. I appreciate it. There was one person in, in my uh, sessions there in St. Louis a couple of years ago who was from Wisconsin, and she said, you know, I represent a really right-wing Christian conservative Wisconsin library community and i feel like i'm being ostracized by all of the things that are being bombarded to me so on the other side christian is talking about that it was just kind of interesting um and i've, I've talked to david about this and harwood does wonderful things but um it is something we need really to talk about and does this work for oak park does that make sense christian Yes, I, I don't want to say to comment too much on that before everybody else gets a chance to speak, but yes, it does. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, I, I started sort of mentally parsing Harwood into two parts, which is um, Harwood, Harwood, the stuff I'm learning, and Harwood, how to use it in Oak Park. Um, I'm trying to absorb the skills separate from how I think I'm going to use the skills in Oak Park, if only because I've run up against a few things that I see in the methodology um, that I, just, I don't know if they will work with the particular community or with the particular group of people that were, were circled for, for this cause. Um, I think that a lot of the skills and a lot of the options we're being presented are really good. Um, I think a lot of the information and a lot of the examples we're being presented are really good. Um, but I've seen a couple of times, and I think this is where um, some members of the lab started to flag a little bit, um, was uh, I see the merit in doing this thing or in asking this question. That's not going to go well here. Um, there, there are certain questions that you, you know, that can't be worded that way here. That conversation can't be started that way here. Or in some cases, I'm not the person who can start that conversation. Um, so I'm still personally working through how do I take this skill and make it still usable for the things that I want to do. It's not that it's not a useful skill. It's maybe I'm not the person who can use that skill, or maybe this skill needs to be put on the back burner. Um, a lot of these items seem to be uh, dependent on already having a relationship with the people that you're talking to, to a point that you feel you cannot offend them or they will understand that your questions or your questioning is coming from a basis of wanting to be more informed and not sort of question as attack. Um, and I don't know that I have that relationship with all of the people I would want to engage with to make significant progress in the things that I want to do. Um, so again, it goes back to maybe I'm not the person who can ask that question. Maybe I'm not the person who could lead that conversation. Um, so I, I think going forward, as I'm learning more about how Harwood works, 
I'm going to have to separate Harwood from Harwood in Oak Park and, and think of them separately until I can figure out a way to, to smush them together. I, uh, I very much appreciate what you, everything you just said, Virginia, because um, my, my, my real intention in all of this was to present to this group of community leaders a, an opportunity to learn a practice, to learn, to learn the tools. Um, and then, and then once having learned them to then determine together how they might be applied to make progress on whatever community objectives we determined we had an opportunity to make progress on. Um, but that for me would have happened later. It would have happened after everyone had an opportunity to, uh, to, to learn about Harwood, the practice, before we started figuring out what does Harwood uh, mean in terms of Oak Park and, and what we think we can do with it here. And, you know, if the, if, if the answer is maybe not, <laughs> maybe not a lot or maybe not everything or maybe only some things, well, that, that's all of that would be for us here in the community to, to determine. Um, so I was definitely looking at, at these labs as let's take some time just to learn about Harwood, the practice, and then later on figure out what does, what does Harwood in Oak Park look like, as you said. Well, I will, uh, I'll jump in. I'm not part of this group, but I did attend one of your prior Harwood sessions. And I, I had, I think, some similar concerns to what Christian and Virginia have expressed. Um, I do wonder whether once staff and the board have gone through the anti-racist training, and then if they can then use that language and framework um, to open a Harwood style conversation, um, that might have a very different effect. And I'm just thinking about, you know, I mean, if you if you really kind of like start off by saying there are you know, different cultural approaches to what is civil discourse and what's an appropriate level of anger and emotion that gets expressed in this kind of meeting and, um, and kind of frame that for the people attending so they're maybe make them a little more aware that their cultural defaults are not necessarily shared by everyone in the room and don't necessarily get to trump other people's. Um, it might lead to a more productive conversation. I I end, I have to do framing like that with my class pretty often whenever we're dealing with touchy subjects. Um, so anyway. And I have to tell you that I, I keep this by my desk <laughs> and I think about it a lot. And I have, I, 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 it, I, I'm not really sure what to do with this and in this relationship with Rashida's anti-racism journey and all of this stuff. Um, it's, it's going to be a big issue for you, David. Marianne, a little bit to your question or to your comment. I feel like some of the participants in this lab are looking at Harwood as a system rather than a toolkit. Um, a little bit like um, take your question, insert on page one, follow the following process. And when you get to the end of that notebook, you will have your, you know, sorted community engagement, whateverness. Um, I think they're hopefully somewhere down the road or somewhere in some of the conversations we have with these people, there will be a chance to express more that these are individual tools that can be used separately or together rather than thinking of it as like an equation where you plug in a something at the beginning and you get a something at the end. Um, because I think that's where it's falling apart because there's no, there's no question and no situation. I think probably for any methodology that you can like stick in the front end and get an answer out the other end. Um, but right now that's sort of how it feels. Um, 
And so everyone is seeing how, oh, well, I get to this point and then it doesn't work. Oh, I get to this point and then it doesn't work rather than saying, oh, I get to this point and then that's a tool I don't use. Um, I, I'm hoping that maybe the more we learn about it and the more we see situations between each other, we can sort that out and, and make that more successful. But for right now, as long as people are thinking of hardwood as like a ball of something rather than different tools they can use, um, I think, you know, people are going to be pretty limited in their in their willingness to use it. Um, Colleen and Matt, did you all have anything to add? I, um, I'm feeling under the weather, so I will keep my video off, but I would just share that um, my takeaway was that I had come in with a pretty open mind about the process and the participants, and it became immediately clear how much tension there was in our virtual space. Um, and I really, I don't know that I want to put this necessarily on Harwood, but I would have really appreciated more opportunities to discuss the methodology um, and do maybe some more level setting before we um, were put off into our virtual um, spaces to do some more deep dives. Um, there were a lot of people who shared that they did not feel that it was a safe space. Um, I think maybe some of that, you know, it has there's some politics maybe there, but um, I also felt that at times that tension that you spoke of was very, uh, very real. Much the same um, as what has been said. I think that going in, there was, it felt like there was an openness that was offered to people and there were people who took it, you know, who accepted that and engaged in it and, and spoke in an open way, um, particularly the black participants toward who are, may or may not have been saying things that they usually do not say in, around white peers. Um, and that the, you know, Myself, I, I know that I had some difficulty processing some of what they were saying. I mean, I knew, I knew it to be true, and yet it was still hearing it um, took me, you know, you know, put me back a step. And I don't think that there was I was alone in that. And I think that changed the dynamic. And I think it spoke, and I think it fed into Christian what you were feeling in terms of not feeling open uh, to, you know, to, and then began censoring yourself. And that was something I was hoping, you know, I, I did, I, I'm sure you were not alone in that feeling. Um, but it definitely felt like the, it brought out a lot of emotional work for people who are used to already doing a lot of emotional work around equity issues. And perhaps the expectation going into this is that they wouldn't have to. Um, and in that particular space, uh, do the work for others. And I think that was uh, perhaps, you know, my perspective was a factor of that is that it, the conversations that started, I don't know that people were the expecting to happen um and i and caught some people a little off balance um as they weren't they may not have been thinking that's where it was going and and contributed to that tension um so i i'm not sure what that next path forward is um but i certainly it was, it was not easy. I mean, it was, it was, there was a lot there, but I think it's, I'm hoping if there is a ways that we can proceed forward, I think that there was a lot of people there who 
want to hear those things um, and share, but I don't know what I don't know what the answer is for how to to make it feel more inclusive and safe at this time. Can I, oh, I'm sorry, can I just, um, in terms of creating a safe space, there's a, a framework that I've found helpful, so I'll just, I'll mention it. There's there's kind of two, two ways that people approach safe space conversations, and one is the idea of like, here is a, um, here is a, like a protective gerbil cage, right? And once you go inside the cage, you should be uh, protected from the outside world and any threats there are. And then there's the, another approach which says, well, we can't make the environment safe. That's going to be impossible. So we have to work on making the individuals tougher or whatever else. And I, I just, I wanted to kind of put that out there because I feel like the safe space conversation is kind of, it's almost its own conversation. And it sounds like maybe this Harwood could have used uh, like a prefatory conversation about what kind of space they were going into, what kind of conversations people would be having, what level of frankness to expect. Do you, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if that's helpful, but just from, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like that conversation didn't happen. Um, so. I could be wrong, but I feel like with the size of the group, there just wasn't enough time given to do that. Um, we start, we sort of just started. Um, and I, I know that I knew some of the people who were there, or I knew of most of the people who were there, but I didn't know everyone and certainly everyone didn't know me. So it was, there was like a very cold open um, before we immediately went into some of the small groups. In the small group, at least for me, I felt like some of the tension dissipated, although my camera not working the first day was not great um, because people didn't know how to identify or classify me or my comments. Um, but I felt like things went a little bit more smoothly when there were fewer people. But then again, those sessions weren't long enough for you to, again, like feel like you were building a rapport with these people where you could start, you know, where you could just say, well, why? And get a response rather than feeling like it was an attack. We never got to that point with enough people in the group um, that you, you felt like you could ask those questions or get deeper. Um, everything just moved pretty fast and you kind of had to just keep moving with everything, but you, we couldn't get very deep because we didn't start establishing those those personal trust kind of connections that I guess I assumed we would sort of be working on. I, 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 I think I assumed there was going to be more of a networking capacity to this because the group was curated and chosen so carefully um, that there was gonna be a little bit more time and space for us all to build interpersonal relationships that would help us afterward. Well, thanks everybody for sharing. Um, I really appreciate it. It's given me some more things to think about. Um, yes, yeah, so I, th I think I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think that it was, um, was, it, was it a safe space? That's an interesting question. I mean, I, I felt that I could, uh, well, no, maybe that's not true. Well, anyway, I, I say I say all this to say that um, I do think that Harwood has brought the library to a point, um, and it's. But at very early on in in this lab, I think I kind of felt it set in for a lot of people that we were about to go through a workshop on how to have how to have more conversations with people, aka more talk. And I know I went into the lab very much like done with the talk that it was time for us to go ahead and address these issues very much head on. And I, I kind of felt that among some other people there too. And so I felt like there was this, there was, we all quickly tried to jump there and skip the practice as to kind of what's been saying and skip the process. 
Um, because I mean, it was a lot, it definitely weighed on me. And I think I made a comment the first day, it weighed on me that I was about to sit in the lab for, you know, five, six hours, and it was going to be about how to have more community conversations when I sat in community conversations for weeks after America to me, and I've sat in book discussions on between the world and me, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, yes, so I know that was all a part of this as well. I want to also acknowledge this was all made more complicated by Zoom. Um, you know, and so they were adapting their practice and how to have these conversations via Zoom was probably not easy. At the same time, I have been in some really good community conversations, productive conversations this year via Zoom. So I, I know it is possible too, but um, I know that that couldn't have been easy for them either. So <clears throat> as far as moving forward, yeah, I don't have any answers either. I do think that at first I was kind of upset that we weren't just going to push through and continue with the lab in January. Then I just kind of let it kind of thought more about it. And I was like, yeah, it couldn't continue the way it did if it, we couldn't just pick up and like act like nothing happened in, in, in last year. So I do understand the desire to slow down. And so um, David, just keep us, I guess, in the loop with what they're thinking at the Innovators Lab. Uh, I do think there is something to be said about setting this stage a little bit better to Mary Ann's point and some what other people have mentioned. I think there's something we can do because the first question was, I believe, what have you learned during COVID-19? And so, you know, there was no way we weren't gonna dive in when that was the question, you know, so all that had happened this year. So. Thanks, Christian. I, I certainly will as I continue to talk with Rich and he continues to get more uh, information from some of the other people that were in the lab as well. All right. Well, thank you, Christian, for um, asking to have this item as part of the agenda. I think this was a very helpful conversation. It certainly was for me um, to, to vocalize some of these things in a way that it, I have had the thought, I have, you know, been thinking about it, but not really, you know, talked about it in this kind of way and hearing the direct feedback from other participants in this way. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any last minute comments about that? Okay. Then as that is the last item on our agenda, we have concluded our uh, scheduled agenda and we are adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. And thank you for being here and part of our meeting. <laughs>